Now, on the program today, I want to address Eastern Orthodoxy again because I was pointed to another post. Uh, this is from a former Lutheran, I think he was a Lutheran LCMS pastor. Uh, I know he went through seminary, and he talks about some of that in the article. Uh, but, but he did a post in response to another post uh, on the doctrine of justification. And this gets at a lot of the central issues dealing with the Eastern Orthodox uh, on the doctrine of justification. Because converts from Lutheranism, of course, <laughs> since justification is the central article of the Christian faith for Lutherans, of course, if they move over to Orthodoxy, naturally the subject of justification is going to come up. It's going to be a very prominent uh, subject in a lot of these discussions. So I wanted to interact a little bit with with this post. It's a very long article here, uh, and a lot of it's dealing with, with uh, patristic sources and uh, the doctrine of justification in the Church Fathers. Uh, but let me just uh, respond to a few things here. It's a very long post, so I won't be able to get to everything, and I want to just spend one program dealing with some of the issues here, uh, and I won't be able to obviously deal with with everything. Now, the he, he lays out a number of points here, um, and he's these five points are summaries of an article that he wrote a long time ago, and the section that I want to focus on is on justification specifically. He has a lot of stuff about atonement, Christ's suffering, and what that means if there's if God the Father's wrath is satisfied, and all those kinds of discussions. But I want to deal not with that issue, uh, but specifically with how justification itself is defined. Uh, and this is the point that he makes. The justification in Christ is moral transformation first and foremost, i.e. renewal akin to sanctification. Now, this, of course, is a huge difference uh, with the Reformation approach and then the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic approach, uh, on the other hand. And the question we're asking is, what is the definition of justification? What does justification mean? What does the term mean? Uh, the, the term that's used in Greek, what, what does that term actually signify? What does it mean? Does that term mean to make righteous? Does it mean a process of becoming righteous? Or does it mean a declaration that one is righteous? And that's the question we have to ask. And most of this article deals with the fathers. But before getting into the fathers, I want to just go to some scripture passages to deal with this subject. Uh, I'm actually working on on a chapter right now for for a project that I've got th that I'm working on on justification, and I'm going over a lot of the scripture passages that deal with the forensic nature of justification and defenses uh, uh, about justification being a forensic verdict, a forensic declaration, that, that being the definition of the term justification. And scripturally, I think this, this can be very, very easily uh, demonstrated to be the case. And so let's stop and take a look at the scriptural testimony of justification. What does it mean? Does it mean a forensic declaration? Is it a legal term? Or is it something else? Is it transformational? So uh, the first passage that I want to look at is one that's been used very often in these discussions from the Reformation uh, approach that, that we've often used, and I think there's a good reason we've used this text, because I think it's a very strong text, and that is, is from Romans 8. And, and this is the point that, that we're going to see. Uh, as we look at a couple of these texts, we're going to see that in Scripture, the, the doctrine of justification, or the word justification, even when it's not being used in its precise um, doctrinal context as we use it, usually use the term, uh, it is placed in a legal setting. It's placed as the opposite of condemnation. So the, the picture is kind of there's a court of law, and you can either be condemned uh, under the law, or you can be justified or acquitted. And that, that's the kind of language that you see, for example, in, in Romans uh, chapter 8, where Paul does exactly this, uh, wherein he, uh, he contrasts justification with condemnation. And so that's Romans 8, 33 and 34. And let's just take a, a quick look at, at what Paul says there. He says, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn? And so note the, the context in which the word justification is placed here. Uh, it, it, the, the word dikaion for justify is the Greek term there. And it's placed in opposition to bringing a charge. Ekalese is the, the term for we'll bring a charge, bring a charge against. Uh, and 
what Paul is saying is you cannot bring a charge against the elect because they are justified. So these two are placed in opposition to each other, bringing a charge and justification. What is bringing a charge? What is it to bring a charge? It's clearly in a legal context. And so justification is placed in a legal context. It, it's that because of which one cannot lay a charge against you. Because you are declared righteous and innocent, no charges can then be laid against you. And then he contrasts this with condemnation. So because God justifies, who is going to be the one to condemn? No one can condemn because justification is then placed in opposition to condemnation because it's the opposite of condemnation. You can either be condemned or you can be justified. Uh, and if justification means a process of becoming righteous, it would not then fit into this context because it would not be the opposite of condemnation. Who is to condemn because you are being made righteous? Th that doesn't really fit the context uh, of, of Paul's use of the term justification. So I think it's pretty clear in this text that there is an opposition between condemnation, this is legal categories, and justification. So you're condemned or you are vindicated or justified declared innocent, righteous, uh, whatever kind of term you want to use. But it's very clear that justification here is not a process. It, it doesn't work that way in this text. And we can look at some other texts as well. Romans 5 uses the, the same uh, type of, of language. If you want to take a look at Romans 5, verse 16, uh, and this is where Paul is talking about Adam and Christ, is contrasting that which came through Adam and that which comes through Christ. And he says... Uh, and the free gift is not like the effect of that one man's sin. For the judgment following the one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. And again, there's this parallel. Uh, and throughout Romans 5, Paul is giving parallels between Adam and Christ. So the parallels are of death and life, sin and righteousness. So it's very clear throughout the text that these parallels have to, have to work off of one another. They are actually opposites. And because that which comes through Adam is condemnation in this text. That which comes through Jesus then is justification, which is the opposite of condemnation. Because in other places he talks about the sin, the actual effects of sin coming through Adam and the and actual righteousness coming to us through Christ. But that's not what he's speaking of here. Here he's speaking of condemnation and vindication. So again, clearly, because of this contrast that, that is made here between justification and condemnation, it makes it clear that justification is not a process of becoming righteous because that wouldn't be the opposite of condemnation. It wouldn't fit within the context. It wouldn't fit within Paul's argument. So it's very clear that that's not what's going on in this text. Let's look at one further text that, that gets into this a little more. So let's look at uh, another example from Matthew chapter 12. Now, Matthew is not talking about the theological doctrine of justification. Okay, he is using the same term, and this gives us a, a, a taste of, of how the term was actually used in regular speech. So this isn't talking about the doctrine of justification the same way Paul is talking about it here, but Jesus is using the same terminology. Dikaiothese is, is the, the term that's, that's used here for justification, coming, of course, from the same uh, deke word group that all of the righteousness and justice justification language in the New Testament comes from. In verse uh, 36, Jesus says, I tell you on the day of judgment, men will render account for every careless word they utter. For your by your words, you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Again, the contrast between justification, being justified and being condemned. And by your words on the day of judgment, you will be justified. In other words, you will be vindicated on the day of judgment. It makes no sense in this passage contextually to say then what Paul, what we're, what Jesus, sorry, is saying is that you will be made righteous on the day of judgment because of your words. No, it's about uh, vindication or condemnation. And that's the contrast that's being made here. So again, it becomes very clear that this is something of a legal term, a, a term of recognizing what something is. And that's exactly what's going on here. Let's look at one more text from the New Testament. We could also get into Old Testament texts that use the same word, too, that were translated. Uh, of course, uh, the Greek Septuagint used these same types of words uh, in the Old Testament. We could look at that, too, and some other books uh, that were written 
in the ancient world that used the same term to discuss exactly how that term was used. Uh, you know, if you look at Chemnitz's examination of the Council of Trent, volume one, his section on justification, he's got a very, very good section on the use of, of, of the Deke word group within uh, ancient writings in general. So he goes through the New Testament, but he also goes through the Septuagint, and then he also goes through different Greek writings, philosophical writings, historical writings, and just shows that this is how this word has generally been used, not just in the New Testament, not even just in the Old Testament, in the Septuagint, but also just in secular writers in general. But there's one further New Testament uh, case I want to look at here. And this comes from Matthew chapter 11, so it's just the chapter right before the one we, we were just looking at. And, and this is not, again, this is not the theological use of the term justification, uh, in the same sense that Paul is using it in Romans 3, 4, and 5. Uh, and what it says here, uh, we can start looking at verse 18. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified, idikaiothe, by her deeds. And this, in this context, clearly wisdom is, <laughs> is not justified in the sense that wisdom is made righteous. Clearly, wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Wisdom is vindicated by the fruits of it. And so it becomes very clear again in this text. We can look at some other texts in the New Testament as well that use similar terminology, but it becomes clear when we look at all of these different texts in the New Testament that the word justify, to justify, justification, does have a very clear legal meaning. If you look at uh, Henry Eister Jacobs' Summary of the Christian Faith, and if you if you have a copy of that book that we've put out with Justin Center Publications, you go to the section on justification, he has a very helpful list of legal various legal contexts in which the doctrine of justification occurs. So I want to just read through that a little bit quickly. Okay, so th this is what Jacob says, and if you have a copy of the book, this is on page 246 of, of volume 1. Uh, the section on, on justification. He says, All the factors of a court of justice are given in passages referring to justification. The judge, Romans 8.33, it is God that justifies. A defendant, Romans 3.19, that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be brought under the judgment of God. A plaintiff or accuser, John 5.45, there is one that accuses you, even Moses. A witness, Romans 2.15, their conscience bearing witness. An indictment, Colossians 2.14, the bond written in ordinances that was against us, a sentence, Deuteronomy twenty-seven twenty-six. Cursed is everyone that continues not in all things written in the book of the law to do them, a code of laws, Deuteronomy twenty-seven twenty-six. the book of the law, an advocate, 1 John 2, 2, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, a satisfaction, Romans eight nineteen. through the obedience of one shall the many be made righteous, an acquittal, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Now, in, in all of these texts, the term justification is not explicitly used in every text uh, that, that Jacob cites here. But what I think he does show pretty clearly here is that legal language abounds throughout both the Old and the New Testament. In different soteriological contexts, there is all sorts of legal language. Pretty much every aspect of the legal system can be shown to be a pretty prominent thing in the Old or the New Testament. And so with a lot of converts to Eastern Orthodoxy, you're going to find people really downplaying the legal aspects of salvation. And uh, I think some will admit that, yeah, there's legal aspects of salvation, but, but oftentimes they'll downplay it so much that it's not really something that they ever talk about. And Jacobs pretty clearly shows throughout this section, and you can look at the section yourself, and he goes into more detail about these things. Um, but it's very, very clear when we look at this that the legal context, the legal metaphor is, is something that is very prominent in Scripture. Now, that's not to say that salvation is purely a legal act and there's no other way of talking about it. Okay, there are all sorts of metaphors for salvation that are used in Scripture. You know, if you if you want a treatment of this, look at the book uh, Just Words by, by uh, Price. This is a very, very good book that talks about the different metaphors that the Bible uses for salvation. And I think he's got a, a lot of really good points in that book. And, and the major point is that it's not just legal categories that we need to use, okay? We don't need to just talk about legal justification, imputation of righteousness, even just vicarious satisfaction. But there are all sorts of metaphors that the Bible does use, that the New Testament uses to talk about redemption, atonement, how that comes to us, uh, how that God's blessings are given to us.
But a very major one is the legal. The legal category is very, very important. It's all over Scripture. Uh, I mean, the whole Mosaic Covenant is a legal kind of, of covenant. And so the, the doctrine of justification then fits within this kind of legal framework. Now, note that we're talking here about the narrow sense of the doctrine of justification. Uh, because if you look at the apology of the Augsburg Confession, Melanchthon argues that justification encapsulates both imputation of righteousness and the renewal of the heart. And Luther in the Small Kid Articles uses similar language. But the formula of Concord later says justification is just legal. And so the way that we deal with this then is, is there's kind of a, a twofold way of using the term justification. So we can talk kind of in a broad sense uh, about justification. And, and that's not really using the scriptural term, but that's using it more as a synecdoche, which means we are talking about the whole by mentioning a part. Uh, okay, so that's an argument that Luther used when talking about uh, the words of institution, for example, was that, well, Jesus held up uh, bread and said, this is my body. He wasn't saying that bread is no longer there because it's a synecdoche. He's identifying the whole thing that is in his hand with one thing that is in his hand, and that is his very own body. And so when he holds up the cup, he says, this is my blood. He's not saying there's no cup there. He's not saying there's no wine there, but you're identifying the whole with the part. So when we talk about justification, then in the broad sense, we're identifying the whole of salvation that God gives to us, the different ways that he saves us with, we are then identifying this with the one aspect, which is justification, and using that as a way to summarize the whole. So that's the broad sense. But we're talking here about the narrow sense of sanctification or sorry, justification, that justification is a purely legal term. Imputation of righteousness and the forgiveness of sins. Those are the two aspects of justification in the narrow sense that we're talking about here. And I think it's very clear in the passages that I just, just cited that justification is not a process. Uh, it's not something that's continuous. It's not the same as sanct sanctification. It's not synonymous with sanctification, but it's something that's different because it is uh, a legal verdict. Uh, and let's look look at a couple other passages in Scripture that, that deal with this same kind of idea. There's a, a text from Romans chapter 5 where we see two parallel statements that use a different term to refer to the same reality. And, and those two terms are justified and reconciled. Uh, let me just read this. This is from Romans 5, starting at verse 8. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we are now justified by his blood much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. And now he's going to repeat that same reality in the next text. He's going to repeat that same reality that by Jesus' death we are justified with just a little bit different language. He says, For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Okay, reconciliation then is used as a parallel term for justification. And this is a point that Augustine actually brings out when he's looking at the book of Romans is that Justification and reconciliation are, are synonymous terms. And reconciliation with God is clearly not the same thing as... Uh, it's clearly not... Sorry, it's not, it's not the same thing as a process of becoming righteous. So to be reconciled with God is to be in a state of being reconciled. We are... We, we are our, our enmity has ended with God because of Jesus' death. And so it's very clear in that text that justification cannot possibly really be a process. It's something that happened because of Jesus' death. It's not the process of becoming righteous, but it's the fact that we already have been reconciled to God. Of course, you go back to the beginning of Romans 5, and you see uh, that justification is spoken of as a past tense reality. Uh, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and clearly that's a reality that it is existent now. It's not being justified as a process, but it's having been justified by faith. We already have as a present reality peace with God. Now, I know that there's a way that you can render that which says that says let us have peace with God instead of we have peace with God, but we're not going to get into the, to the, some of the grammar issues there. Uh, but, but I think that the point of the statement is that we have peace with God already as a present reality because we have been justified, because that is a verdict that is placed on us. We are reconciled to God. We are not condemned because we are 
justified. All of the evidence, I think, in the book of Romans especially, which is the the most lengthy treatment of the doctrine of justification, of course, in the New Testament, uh, this legal language shows up all over the place. And so it becomes very clear when we study the book of Romans that it does have a generally legal forensic meaning. And even a lot of Roman Catholic scholars will admit that the term has a forensic meaning, uh, even though that's not historically how Rome has defined the doctrine of justification. So, you know, look at Joseph Fitzmaier's commentary on the book of Romans, for example, uh, where he basically argues that Luther was correct in understanding the doctrine of justification, understanding justification as a legal term rather than some kind of a process. Now, I know I've only dealt with a small statement that was at the beginning of the article so far, but I think that really is the major point that I want to get at. And I want to spend more time looking at Scripture itself to see what Scripture actually says. And we didn't even get into the language of imputation, logizomai, what that means, which is also a term of, of reckoning or counting, which is related to justification throughout this discussion of Abraham being reckoned as righteous in Romans 4, uh, which again points to the forensic nature of justification, that it's not a process, it's something that's reckoned or counted to us through faith. Um, Now, I want to read another section of this, which gets at a, a different issue. Uh, where basically the argument that, that he's making is Lutherans, because we have such a robust theology of the cross, really miss the resurrection and think it's completely irrelevant. It doesn't really play a part in our salvation. So uh, let me read this. This is going to be a pretty long, uh, long section. Uh, and he asks the question, does the Lutheranism maintain the integrity of the spirit and of the patristic witness? Now we're going to deal with the patristic issue also. Uh, But first, he says, no, whenever the topic of justification arises, Lutherans run to the cross and say, see, it's finished. We're justified in going to heaven. But the issue of becoming justified involves two things. One, Christ overcoming the problem of our sin, death, and bondage to the devil. Two, our reception of Christ's solution or victory. The division over justification between the Orthodox Church and Lutherans is primarily about the second part, not about the first part. There are differences over the first part, which Mr. Fields points to when he makes a case for Christ suffering our punishment, but no matter how you calculate the atonement, it still amounts to Christ dying for the forgiveness of our sins and being raised for our justification. We cannot be forgiven without the cross, though the Orthodox like to point out that God has always been desirous of forgiving us and did not need to be bought off with a payment of human suffering. Okay, that's a major issue with the atonement, but we're not going to get into that right now. And we could not be justified without the resurrection. Okay, and then he goes on to say what Mr. Fields, who's the person that he's he's been responding to in this article, and Lutherans do is shift the weight of justification from the cross and resurrection to the cross. They say on the cross, Christ pays the penalty for our sins and supplies perfect righteousness to God for us. The supplying of a perfect righteousness, Christ merits to God, while taking away the sin, away sins is called our justification. The resurrection is reckoned the proof that Christ's offering is accepted and that the cross accomplished everything. The reception of it, it is finished, is through the Holy Spirit who creates faith in a person from nothing. And through this faith gives to the believer... Christ with his it is finished so that it is finished for you. The consequence of the cross with its it is finished is that the final judgment is solved in your favor. The Lutherans claim that this is taught by the scriptures, but what that really means is that Luther and the other Lutheran teachers have come to these conclusions contrary to the fathers, I contend, and passed their teachings on to their disciples down to the present day. Okay, now, so so the major issue here uh, that that we're dealing with is how does the resurrection play into justification? How does the resurrection play into our salvation? Uh, And the way that he portrays the Lutheran view is that the resurrection really just is a proof that Jesus' death already saved us. So so he's saying that in the Lutheran view, the, the resurrection of Jesus really doesn't have anything to do with our salvation. It just kind of is, is proof, and it's a nice, helpful add-on to the cross, but it doesn't in and of itself play any central role uh, for our salvation. Now, I, I think this probably is the case in a lot of evangelical or Protestant Christianity. I think that there has been an a uh, an underemphasis on the resurrection, and and that's not really a Lutheran issue. Uh, that's an issue with the Western Church, and and so you know you have to give credit where it's due. And the Eastern Church has done a better job at, at focusing on the resurrection as something that actually has efficacy, as the resurrection as something that actually saves, that actually has power to do something other than show something. Uh, and and I think that that is a strength of the Eastern position, but. Uh, that doesn't mean 
that the Western view of atonement is wrong. Now, there's a couple reasons for that. And first, uh, because Luther himself does not ignore the resurrection. If you look at Luther's theology, I think he has a very robust theology of resurrection. Uh, it's something that, that I deal with a little bit uh, in my book, The Righteousness of One, in the chapter on Luther's Doctrine of Justification. I try to show that uh, that the resurrection actually has a large part to play in, in justification for Luther, not just the cross. Uh, and Luther, of course, emphasizes the Christus Victor aspect of the atonement as well. I don't think that a uh, satisfaction idea is absent from Luther either, uh, but I think the Christus Victor there is, uh, does play a prominent role in Luther's own theology. Now, certain aspects of the Lutheran tradition have lost the idea of resurrection as anything significant. So Pieper, for example, as much as I love Pieper, he does a really bad job dealing with the resurrection. Uh, he doesn't really deal with it at all. Uh, he he deals with it a little bit, but but it really has no prominence in his discussion um, of the atonement as much as the cross does. But there's been, I think, improvement in that area, uh, partially through the work of 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 Aulain and his study Christus Victor, where he shows that Luther held to a very strong Christus Victor approach to the atonement. Now, of course, as I said before, I don't totally buy his thesis because he says that's the only atonement approach that Luther had, and I think he has a really weak case. Uh, in that way, because he actually even acknowledges and mentions that, okay, yeah, Luther does use this kind of satisfaction language, but he doesn't really mean what he says. And you find, you know, people like Gerhard Ferdi actually doing the same thing, just kind of brushing off Luther's sermonology as if he just doesn't really mean what he says. And I don't, I don't really think that's a fair way, way to deal with the sources. Um, but with that being said, there, there have been some positive movements toward a better theology of resurrection. Uh, especially when you look at the way that objective justification has been talked about, for example. And this this is something that, that uh, Kurt Marquardt ha- dealt a bit with in talking about the doctrine of objective justification. Now, what is the doctrine of objective justification? Well, objective justification is the idea that at his resurrection, Jesus vindicated the entire world uh, before God. He did something for all of humanity— And this has to do with our idea of universal atonement. But in his resurrection, Jesus vindicated himself. Jesus was vindicated before God the Father. He was vindicated as having fulfilled the law perfectly, vindicated as having paid the price for humanity's sin, and vindicated as the Son of God, the one who defeated death. And so through the vindication of Jesus— the world is vindicated. So objectively, the entire world is vindicated through the very vindication of Jesus himself at his resurrection. And that's the way that Marquardt talks about objective justification, and some other people do, and that's the way that I think we should be talking about it. Um, and you even find this kind of language, not, not objective justification specifically, but the tie-in with the resurrection and atonement and the vindication of Jesus uh, in some Reformed writers, like uh, Richard Gaffin, for example, and some others uh, in the Reformed tradition. And so there have been a lot of movements toward seeing a, a real uh, purpose to the to the resurrection in the atonement. Uh, and I think that there's been a lot of good stuff done. I mean, N.T. Wright, for example, has has done some some good work on the resurrection. I don't totally agree with him, but but he's done some good work talking about what it means that Christ is the first fruits. You know, Christ is explained to be part of the first fruits of the resurrection in Paul's theology, uh, and. You know, what that means is, is when you go back to, to Jewish thought uh, in the first century, okay, you go back to the Jewish ideas of resurrection. The Jews had an idea of resurrection, at least some of the Jews. We know that the Pharisees didn't believe, or the, sorry, the Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. The Pharisees did. That's pointed out in the Gospels. Uh, but the, the Jewish, the aspects of the Jewish tradition that accepted resurrection believed that there was going to be a final resurrection of the just not some resurrection of a Messiah in history. And what Jesus does then is he raises from the dead before everyone else, and that's a shock. The Jews didn't expect that. The disciples didn't expect that. And the fact that Jesus raises now has a very strong impact on our theology then, on the theology of the the first century church, because it means that the resurrection has begun. In Jesus, the general resurrection, the resurrection of all things has begun. So it's an eschatological event uh, that the new age has broken into the old age, into the present, as Jesus, the vindicated Messiah, has risen from the dead, initiating this this advent of resurrection where that time where we will all be resurrected 
And so then we see that our resurrection is not a separate event from Jesus' resurrection. It's separate in time. But Jesus' resurrection is, in fact, the cause of our bodily resurrection also because we are in Christ. We are identified with him and his resurrection, and so we too will raise because Jesus rose. And so our resurrection is because of Jesus' own resurrection and his own vindication. And so if we take all of these different strands of thought, uh, of resurrection theology that has developed in the Western Church, even in Lutheranism as well, recently, we see that, no, in fact, you can hold to a very strong theory of satisfaction of uh, the act of obedience of Christ imputed to us and this strong idea of resurrection for justification. So I don't think it's the case that as a Lutheran, you have to say, well, the resurrection doesn't do anything. The resurrection is just some kind of a proof that Jesus' death did what it should have done. And so it's kind of a straw man argument here. I mean, in some sense, it's not a straw man because there are those in the past who did kind of speak that way, but it's surprising to me that he would have gone to seminary. I don't know if w- which seminary he went to, but if he went to either St. Louis or Fort Wayne, it's surprising to me that he wouldn't have heard anything else about the resurrection. They wouldn't have really talked about objective justification. Uh, I-, I don't know if I totally buy that. So it's kind of a hard thing for me to, to see that this particular uh, man had been a part of Lutheranism and really didn't see anything in the resurrection except that it's just a proof of what happened on the cross. Uh, I- I'd be very shocked to see that that was the case. Now, in the next part of the article here, uh, what what the author is doing is he's critiquing uh, the original article that that he's critiquing for having a doctrine of justification that doesn't really sound Lutheran but sounds orthodox, according to him. And this is what he says. He says, Mr. Field's description of justification seems to be close to the orthodox mark, which is a good thing. But is it Lutheran? I have already established that Lutheranism does not allow any sort of personal renewal or transformation into justification. The justification from Lutheran baptism works the same way. Any renewal or sanctification-like activity is treated as a result of being imputed with the merit of Christ. Even the term regeneration does not admit into baptism justifying activity any notion of renewal or ontological change in us. Whenever a linking of regeneration with justification happens in Lutheranism, whether talking about baptism or not, the term must refer to the creation or strengthening of faith. This is insisted in the formula of Concord Solid Declaration 3. And since... In Lutheranism, faith is the sole work of the Holy Spirit in a person, and this is the limit of transformation language in Lutheran justification. That is, in Lutheranism, the only thing that is transformed in the act of being justified in Christ through the Holy Spirit is the human will. It is transformed from an unbelieving to a believing will. And a believing will grasps hold of Christ's merit, possesses them, and thus justified apart from works. Any form of personal transformation beyond that of the human will is excluded from Lutheran justification and categorized as sanctification, the fruits of being justified by faith." Now, the the problem here is that he doesn't have the, the distinction between a narrow and a broad sense of, of justification. He's not working with, with those distinctions, which I think we need to be working with. Uh, because you can take statements of Luther, and, and I, you know, showed some of this in my previous book and, and uh, in my upcoming work as well, that in certain statements of Luther, union with Christ is said to be part of justification. So union is part of justification. Uh, In the apology, as I mentioned before, you know, regeneration is said to be part of justification. So those certainly are changes. That that is some kind of a renewal, a change in the person. But that's the broad sense of justification. And so he's not quite nuanced enough, I don't think, because he needs to stop and say, well, in one sense, the Lutheran confessions actually do say this, and Luther says this. But when we're talking about the narrow sense of justification, yes, it is only legal. And these things are, are effects, of course. They are effects. They are not, not causes. We're not, we're not justified, declared righteous based on some change within us. We're declared righteous because of the merit and righteousness of Christ, which has to do with his life, death, and resurrection. So that's a, a, a something I want to point out as, as what I think is a, is a weak point in the article here is that he doesn't really understand uh, the distinction there. Uh, and so let's look now into some of of the patristic sources because he deals here with a lot of patristic sources and uh, the the sources that are cited uh, in the article that he's responding to are mostly Eastern fathers um, and he's taking this from Martin Chemnitz and Chemnitz has a good well Chemnitz is always good on the church fathers on the patristic sources uh, Chemnitz is very good. Uh, in outlining the beliefs of, of the church fathers and how they do line up with the Lutheran 
uh, confession and where they don't line up also. I mean, Chemnitz is pretty honest about these things. I don't think he's particularly unfair in trying to make every single church father sound Lutheran, but he's trying to say that there are strands of patristic teaching that do agree with us. Uh, and I think Chemnitz is right. Now, I'm not going to deal specifically with the quotes that, that are dealt with here, but I want to show some other fathers that have a very clearly Lutheran understanding of, of justification. Now, he deals here with St. Basil uh, and Irenaeus and Athanasius. Uh, Cyril of Alexandria is another one that, that he deals with here. Now, I'm not going to deal with these particular figures, um, primarily because my study has not been as much on the Eastern Fathers' doctrine of justification. Um, I, I think that there certainly are hints of a more Lutheran-sounding doctrine of justification in Basil, uh, and, and also, well, in Athanasius sometimes, but sometimes Athanasius sounds like he really completely rejects uh, sola fide in certain places. So, so I don't know if that's really the best place that I would go in the Church Fathers. Uh, but here, here's what we have to establish. We don't have to establish that every single church father believed exactly the same thing about justification as the Book of Concord. We don't have to to do that. Uh, you know, th that's an unrealistic expectation, and there's no reason why we have to do that. Because as Lutherans, we don't have the claim that the entire church has always taught the things that we taught, uh, and we are consistent with the Catholic faith, the universal faith. Because if you're an honest reader of the Church Fathers, you have to see that there are different strands of thought. There are certain fathers who are influenced one way, certain on other way. You know, if you look at exegesis, they do it very, very differently depending on what area of the world one is writing in. In terms of atonement, there are different emphases. Uh, so Cyril of Alexandria, for example, does not really emphasize a satisfaction type of view of the atonement. He, he emphasizes theosis and union. Now, I still don't think that theosis is the same kind of developed idea of theosis that you have in the contemporary Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, and I think Cyril is, is, is right in most of what he says. But that's his emphasis. So he doesn't emphasize the legal categories. That's not really in Cyril. But we shouldn't expect all of the theologians of the early church to have the same emphases, to have the same understandings of everything. So I would like to look at a couple figures who I think have a very clearly more Lutheran understanding of justification. Now, he mentions Ignatius here. I do think Ignatius can be read to have a Lutheran view of justification to an extent, but Ignatius does not have really enough—there's not really enough evidence because there's not enough text of Ignatius to really prove that. So I'd rather look at some other sources that I think are more clear. And if you want to go back to some of the earliest sources, let's look at two of the Apostolic Fathers. And these two Apostolic Fathers are extremely clear on this point. Uh, and I'll, you know, I'll plug for my book again, but uh, I deal with, with these figures in my book on the Doctrine of Justification. I try to demonstrate that, that both um, uh, First Clement and the Epistle to Diognetus have a reformational type of understanding of justification. That's not to say that they would necessarily agree in every point. I don't really know because we don't have that much evidence, but what we do have points to something that is not what you'll find in the Eastern Orthodox or the Roman Catholic traditions, but it is something that you will find in the Reformation tradition. And so the first thing I want to look at is from uh, First Clement, the first epistle of Clement. This is from uh, from the 90s AD, so it's one of the earliest uh, post-canonical books that we have. And I could say it's maybe the earliest, but it depends on where you're dating the Didache. I tend to think that the Didache is a little later than a lot of uh, people do. Some people try to argue that it was actually during the lifetime of the apostles. I, I don't buy that for, for several reasons. But uh, let's take a look at First Clement. Uh, this is... Uh, no matter where you date other books, this is one of the earliest, at least, texts that we have outside of the canon of the New Testament uh, that testifies to the belief of Christians. So this is from 1 Clement chapter uh, 32. And I'm just going to read the whole chapter, which is only four verses. Anyone who sincerely considers these matters one by one will understand the magnificence of the gifts that are given by God. For from Jacob come all the priests and Levites who minister at the altar of God, from him comes the Lord Jesus according to the flesh. From him comes the kings and rulers and governors in the line of Judah. And his other tribes are held in no small honor, seeing that God promised that your seed shall be as the stars of heaven. And therefore were glorified and magnified not through themselves or their own works, 
or the righteous actions that they did, but through his will. And so we, having been called through his will in Christ Jesus, are not justified through ourselves or through our own wisdom or understanding or piety or works that we have done in holiness of heart, but through faith by which Almighty God has justified all who have existed from the beginning, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. This is a really powerful text, uh, because in this text, he's talking about justification. Now, he uses the term justify in another part of of the book, and he says, and people try to take the fact that he uses justify somewhere else, and it very clearly isn't talking about sola fide to say, see, here he uses the term justify, and it means something totally different, so he doesn't believe in sola fide. Now, this is something we have to stop and realize when we read ancient texts. Uh, And something we have to realize when we read the book of James and other texts in the New Testament is that there were not working with systematic theological categories in the third in the first century. And so just because James used the term justify doesn't mean that he even had in mind anything like what Paul was talking about when he uses the term justify. And so we don't have to assume that because Clement uses this term in two places, and it seems to say two contradictory things then, that well, uh, we just can't really know what Clement's saying because he just kind of contradicts himself, or, uh, well, this other thing disproves what Clement says here, so he must mean something different than what it seems like he's saying. We don't want to do that. I think it's easier to say, wait, he's actually talking in two completely different contexts. He's addressing two completely different issues. He just happens to use the same word, but he's addressing two completely different topics. But in this text, uh, he's using the, uh, the term justified, uh, and he seems to be paralleling this with being glorified and magnified. That, that seems to be what, what, he's, um, what he's paralleling this with because he's talking about people in the Old Testament. He's talking about the Levites specifically, the tribes of Israel, who were glorified and magnified not because of their works or righteous actions, but through his will. So God's will establishes the gifts that are being given, which is the very first part of the section that talks about the magnificence of the gifts that are given by God. And so that there were blessings and promises, that there was glorification, that there was, that they were magnified, as it says here, in the old covenant was not because of their works, not because of their actions, but because of something else, which is the will of God. This is a pretty comprehensive statement because it doesn't say not not through certain works, not through works of the law, which you can then say, well, works of the law are just ceremonial works, these kinds of works, but it, no, it's just righteous deeds in general. Not through any works or righteous actions, but through his will. And then there's a parallel statement. He's talking about, you know, the Levites, and he's talking about uh, the nation of Israel, and then he switches to talk about us as believers. And so we, similarly, similarly to Israel, we also have been called through his will in Christ Okay, so not by our works, but his will. We've also been called by his will, which is in Christ. And we are not justified through ourselves uh, in the same way that, that the Old Testament saints were not magnified or glorified by them through themselves. We are not justified through ourselves or our own wisdom or understanding or piety or works that we have done in holiness of heart, but through faith. Okay, he's talking about that which receives justification. What do we have to do to be justified? Well, this is a pretty comprehensive list. Clement is really ruling out anything other than faith. I mean, it's very clearly a declaration of sola fide, even if the word alone does not actually literally appear here. I mean, he he counts uh, out—let's see all the things that he counts out. Wisdom. It's not wisdom that justifies us. Or understanding. Or piety or works that we have done in holiness of heart. So notice that he talks about piety and works that we have done in holiness of heart. So he's not talking here about, you know, external works of the law. He's not talking about any kind of hypocritical obedience, hypocritical works. But he's actually talking about works that are done in holiness of heart. So he's talking about works done with a purity of heart. Even those good works don't justify us. And so there really is no room for anything else to be added to this. It's very clear that it is either faith or any of these things, and it's not any of these things, so it's faith. 
And faith is that by which the Almighty God, as he says, has justified all who have existed from the beginning to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So he leaves faith and faith alone as the means of receiving justification, not only for us, but also for those in the Old Covenant and also for those who have existed for all time. And so this is one of the earliest interpretations of Paul and Paul's doctrine of justification. Well, it really is the earliest interpretation of Paul's doctrine of justification that we have in anything outside of the New Testament. And it very clearly confirms exactly how the Reformation has understood Paul's discussion of works of the law and of justification. Uh, Now let's take a look at the next thing, which I think is very clear, which is the Epistle to Diognetus. Now we don't know exactly when this was written. It was written definitely later. uh, It was definitely written later uh, than First Clement was, uh, but but we don't know exactly when it was written. It's an interesting work. It's an apologetic work, and it comes from one of the apologists. Usually, it was um, said to be by Justin Martyr. Um, that that was the the old old uh, identification was Justin Martyr, but when you look at Justin Martyr, both theologically and stylistically, it it's very clear that this is not by Justin Martyr, uh, and it seems that just because it was a a pretty popular apologetic work and Justin was the most popular of the apologists of the time, it just kind of got attributed to him because it's an anonymous work. So we don't know who, um, we we have no idea who actually wrote this, but. When we take a look at this, uh, specifically in chapter 9, we see a very clear statement of the doctrine of justification, the doctrine of the fall, of sin, of grace, justification, righteousness, which is a very clear um, interpretation of, of Paul, which would again line up with how a Lutheran would read these things. And so this is really, this is probably the earliest extensive explanation of Paul's idea of imputation and justification. And where what we see here is something that is very, very similar to what, exactly what uh, we, we find in the Lutheran Reformation. So let's just read uh, the beginning of chapter of chapter 9 here. So then, having already planned everything in his mind together with his child, he permitted us, he's talking about God, of course, God permitted us, during the former time, and w- what he's what he's he's answering an objection here which is a common objection in the early church which was the question why did christianity if it's true come so late in history why is it something new because you know th- there really was a uh, skepticism about everything anything that that was innovative or that was new because that which was ancient was seen to be the most true and the most pure so there was a skepticism about christianity just because it was something new uh so that's that's the 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 question that he is trying to answer that's the objection that he's trying to give an answer to Okay, so then, having already planned everything from his mind in his mind together with his child, he permitted us during the former time to be carried away by undisciplined impulses as we desired, led astray by pleasures and lusts, not at all because he took delight in our sins, but because he was patient, not because he approved of that former season of unrighteousness, but because he was creating the present season of righteousness, in order that we who in the former time were convicted by our own deeds as unworthy of life might now by the goodness of God be made worthy, having clearly demonstrated our inability to enter the kingdom of God on our own, might be enabled to do so by God's power. So here he's setting up the argument. He's saying God didn't come earlier in history, he didn't send Jesus earlier in history because God wanted us to see our inability to save ourselves. He wanted us to see our sin and the fact that we could not save ourselves by our own works. And then the answer is going to come in the form of of the doctrine of justification. Uh, And then he says, When our unrighteousness was fulfilled, when it had been made perfectly clear that its wages, punishment, and death were to be expected, then the season arrived during which God had decided to reveal at last his goodness and power. Oh, the surpassing kindness and love of God. He did not hate us or reject us or bear a grudge against us. Instead, he was patient and forbearing. In his mercy, he took upon himself our sins. He gave up his own son as a ransom for us, the holy one for the lawless, the guiltless for the guilty, the just for the unjust, the incorruptible for the corruptible, the immortal for the mortal. This is a beautiful uh, exposition of the doctrine of, of substitutionary atonement here, that he actually takes on himself our sins. Our sins are actually placed on him, on himself. Uh, that that his own son was given as a ransom for us, and he has these parallels. He was he is lawless. He 
he sorry he is uh, holy he is guiltless he is immortal he is just and all of these things are given up so that we who have the opposite attributes might be saved and then he he uh, asks the question for what else but his righteousness could have covered our sins here we have the first very clear language after the new testament of Christ's righteousness. Notice that righteousness is identified not with God's righteousness or his covenant faithfulness or anything like that, but righteousness is specifically identified with the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. And this righteousness is not said to be infused in us. This righteousness is not said to to enable us to do good works. It's not said to come within us and help us to grow. Instead, it says that it covered us our sins. His righteousness covered our sins. That sounds a lot like imputation. And then he goes on to say, in whom was it possible for the lawless and ungodly to be justified except in the Son of God alone? Now, this is interesting because he parallels being his God, Christ's righteousness covering sins than with justification. And so he's saying that these are the same things. These two are parallel being covered by the righteousness of Christ and being justified. Well, that sure sounds like a Lutheran doctrine of justification. So it's a lot like a Lutheran doctrine of justification. That justification is the fact that that even though we are sinless, we are covered by the righteousness of another, by alien righteousness, that of Jesus Christ himself. Uh, And then he he says, O sweet exchange, O the incomprehensible work of God, O the unexpected blessings that the sinfulness of many should be hidden in the one righteous person, and while the righteousness of one should justify many sinners. Now there's a parallel here again between the sin being hidden in Christ and us being justified. Here we have to take this parallel into account because... If justified means to make righteous, then the parallel doesn't work. Or we'd have to say, well, Jesus became our sin, literally became sin. He literally became a sinner and and, and had a process of becoming sinful. And now, in exchange, we are now entered into a process of becoming righteous. That, That doesn't work. But instead... Our sin is hidden in Jesus. It's hidden. He covers it so that God does not any longer see it. And that is the parallel then to justification, which comes through the righteousness of one, which is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is the name of my book. (laughs) That's where the name comes from, is that phrase from Diognetus, the righteousness of one. So it's very clear then with this language of our sins are hidden because of Christ and his righteousness covers us. This is imputation. This is double imputation, if you want to talk that way. Uh, This is the reality of the great exchange. In fact, he even uses uh, this language. Um, Oh, sweet exchange, incomprehensible work of God. So this is very, very clear uh, in this text, I think. I I think these these two texts make it abundantly clear uh, that the Lutheran doctrine of justification is not some kind of new thing that, that came we came up with at the Reformation. Now, we don't have to prove, as I said, that every single church father believed this because, you know, the, the Eastern Orthodox or the Roman Catholics, when they try to argue that every single church father ever believed what they believe, they have to do a lot of serious twisting of these texts to say, well, they didn't really mean what they said. They really meant something totally different. Uh, and I don't want to be doing the same thing because I don't have to do the same thing. Uh, because the way that, that we view church history, you know, Chemnitz talks about tradition in church history, is that we do see ourselves as the church. We, we, are the continui- we, we are in continuity with the early church. We are the same one holy Catholic and apostolic church that Christ founded that has gone throughout the centuries. And so because of that, we have to look at the early church as important Uh, We have to say that the Holy Spirit was guiding his church, that he was leading people into all truth, that he was doing all of these things. And so because of that, we can't be like the contemporary evangelical Protestants who ignore church history and think that everything started with Billy Graham. Uh, Or even to try to think that everything started with the Protestant Reformation. That, That would not be accurate. That would not be helpful. 
But at the same time that we acknowledge that God has been guiding his church, that we are in continuity with the early church, we have to recognize that God did not set up the church as some kind of infallible authority and some kind of infallible tradition that then runs alongside of Scripture as if we have some consistent testimony outside of Scripture that is unchanging and that there is one unified belief that is the belief of the church fathers, because we don't really find this in, in any context that there is the belief of the church fathers. There's different views on just about everything in the early church. I mean, there's different views about what it even means that Christ was pre-existent. Was he a pre-existent person, or was he just pre-existent in the mind of God? You find that distinction between Irenaeus and Justin Martyr, who we actually both consider to be—we tend to consider both of them to be pretty orthodox— Now, of course, later as these issues were hashed out, we realized, well, Justin was actually wrong on this and Irenaeus wasn't. Um, But we have to be able to say, look, this church father is right and this church father is wrong. So you can throw out a church father who disagrees with this. Uh, I'm not going to say that you can't. You can find church fathers who define justification as a process. Augustine does. Augustine, at times, defined justification as the forgiveness of sins, but other times he defines justification as a process because of the Latin term for justification that, that, that really has that kind of meaning. And so we don't have to stop and say, oh, Augustine said the wrong thing. We have to abandon our thought because Augustine doesn't agree with us or St. Basil doesn't agree with us or uh, whoever it might be. But <laughs> we have to say, wait, maybe they were wrong because we have testimonies in the church that this is the faith of the church. There are testimonies from other fathers that there was also another belief in the church. But having a variety of beliefs doesn't mean that that, uh, that one of them is necessarily wrong. So all we have to do uh, is, is not to show that it's a unanimous belief. We have to show primarily that it's taught in Scripture. And secondarily, we have to show that it is a part of the church's tradition. It doesn't have to be the only part of the church's tradition historically, but it has to be a part of the church's tradition. Now, if, if I were to, if we were to look back and say no one taught anything anywhere near what Luther taught about justification, there's never been one statement in all of church history that sounds anything like what Luther taught. Well, then maybe we should step back and kind of reevaluate, but that's not the case. It's not the case. Uh, So I think we're on pretty safe ground. And and Kenneth does that too. I mean, Kenneth is honest and says, you know, there are a lot of different views. And uh, but (laughs) and Kenneth makes the point, you know, when they're really in the times of of anguish of their soul, when they're on their deathbeds, in their prayers, all Christians really believe in sola fide. uh, And Pieper makes that point, too. And and, and it's very, very true, I think. And that's what you'll find in even the Middle Ages. You know, Uh, St. Anselm's book on on death and dying, for example, uh, you see this great exposition of the doctrine of justification because he's dealing pastorally in that context. uh, And he knows that the only assurance in death is is really to be found in Christ and what he has done for us. Uh, if I had time, I'd look also at St. Ambrose and St. John Chrysostom, who I've dealt with on other programs as well, who I think are, are two that are very helpful in this discussion of justification. Uh, but I think that that sufficiently shows that the Lutheran doctrine of justification is, one, biblical, and two, historical. It is there in some of the earliest sources. You really can't honestly read First Clement and Diognetus in any other way uh, if you're really going to be honest with the text and honest with the context. I understand that Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox Theologians are going to try to make these say something different, but I, the, the case is really clear. I mean, just on a plain reading of the text, that's just what it says, uh, and you're really not going to get get around it. So thanks for listening to the program today. I hope you uh, in, enjoyed the program today. If you have any... Mm-hmm.